Institute uh, of, state, of the State University of New York. This is our first public forum for this fall, and we can't, uh, it's been a beautiful fall, and it's a beautiful day. Uh, today's forum is called Making School Resources Matter. Uh, I'm Tom Gaze, by the way. I'm director of the Rockefeller Institute. And this is the, uh, I think, the third in a series of uh, annual uh, forums on these issues of um, school resources, uh, school change, and, um, and excellence in uh, education in New York State. Fortunately, these have all been co-sponsored with a wonderful co-sponsor, the New York State Association of, S of School Business Officials. Um, and um, we are delighted to be working with them, with Michael Borges, uh, Executive Director of NYSASPO, as well as Deborah Cunningham, uh, Director of uh, Education and Research at the Association. Um, I also want to thank, while I'm in, in the uh, business of thinking people, Bob Bullock has been working with the uh, nice SASBO for over these years to put together this series, and he's done a wonderful job in organizing the forum. I also, also want to thank our wonderful staff here, um, Patty Cadrette, Mike Cooper, Michelle Charbonneau, um, Let's see, I should also mention Freda Bear um, and, um, and, Joe Cha and Joe Chamberlain back there uh, keeping all the electronics working. So thank you very much. They always keep everything working, and, uh, and we appreciate it. Um, this is uh, an interesting part of the uh, series. Uh, the other first series, I, first part of the series, I think, dealt with uh, just the severity of the fiscal crisis for many of the schools, and we, things were rather dark back then, and they still are tight, um, despite the increase in the state uh, budget uh, for school resources this past year. Um, and then last year we also talked about balancing, creating a balance between tax, uh, taxes on the one hand, uh, tax reduction, uh, tax affordability, um, and school excellence on the other. Now this is a more of a nuts and bolts type discussion about where do you put resources into in order to increase school um, uh, uh, excellence and to increase learning. So I look forward to the discuss this discussion. Uh, just by way of uh, advertising for the Institute, I should also note that the Institute has been working on a number of these issues, or at least related issues. Uh, the Institute has always been working on matters of public finance related to schools. Um, there's a couple of publications you might find at our website at www.rockins.org. One is our 100th um, state revenue report, uh, which suggested at least in the last quarter, uh, state revenues have been doing quite well. Um, but we also have our annual Blinken report, which looks at the long-term trends, and that suggests that, that uh, maybe the short-term blip is sort of a short-term blip, that the long-term situation isn't all that great. Um, the Institute has also been working with SUNY on a number of other issues related to education. One of them has to do with uh, in, uh, teacher excellence, teacher preparation, uh, teacher induction, professional development, and so on. Um, I also want to thank one of our panelists here, Hamp Langford, for actually working with us uh, or helping us on this um, paper. It will be coming out, uh, I think, sometime in the next several weeks. So uh, that said, we've been working on some of these issues. Also, I would like to mention just a couple of, uh, of uh, upcoming forums. One forum uh, will be on October 7th, Demographic Trends in the Adirondacks, that is co-sponsored with the Adirondack Research Consortium. Um, the following day, on Thursday, we're going to have a book talk, Privilege and Prejudice, The Life of a Black Pioneer by Clifton Wharton, new book out of Michigan uh, State Press. Uh, Cliff Wharton, fascinating person and also very dear to us because he was the chancellor who established the Rockefeller Institute of Government and the Rockefeller College at the University of Albany. So, 
Um, I look forward to the panelists, and, be, and then, uh, but before I turn over the mic to Mike Borges, uh, who will do some additional introductions, um, I have two requests. First, if you have anything electronic that's, that's likely to go beep, please shut it down right now. Also, when we do have conversations, and I hope we have plenty of time for conversation in this uh, in these uh, during these panels, or at least after this, after the uh, panelists have their say, um, please identify yourself as well as your organization. We're recording this, and it'll be very good to, to know who you are. Thank you very much, Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'll just be a brief uh, remarks. Um, as Tom alluded to, um, you know, this is our third uh, annual school finance symposium that we put on with the Rockefeller Institute, and we really appreciate um, their co-hosting these events with us. Um, the purpose of these symposiums is, is really to um, educate, inform uh, state policymakers and local policymakers about school finance issues and spur them into action um, to address some of the issues that are raised by these discussions and these presentations. Because we believe that sound budgetary practices and effective allocation of resources are integral to the success of initiatives to improve uh, student academic achievement and deliver a sound basic education to all students in the state. Our association encourages all school boards and superintendents to actively engage their uh, school business officials, their education CFOs, in these, in these discussions about how to achieve their district strategic goals and objectives. I also want to thank our panelists who have come from far and near uh, for participating in today's presentation. So now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Keisha Kluke from Politico New York, who will be our moderator. Um, I've known her since she's worked at the, at the Utica Dispatch, right, Observer Dispatch. And you know, she's been already making a name for herself in the last couple of months that she's been working for Politico New York, covering education in New York State. So welcome, Keisha. And uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the, the next hour or so of uh, presentations and discussions. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm a little shorter than everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm the product of two teachers. Uh, my mother teaches at Peru uh, School in Upstate, and my dad teaches for SUNY. So I'm uh, very familiar both as a reporter on education issues and also uh, from my family perspective as well, <laughs> having heard it at home many times. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I'm going to keep it short because we definitely want to hear from these panelists. I had the pleasure of having dinner with a few of them last night, and they have a lot to say. Um, so first of all, I um, just want to again stress how important this topic is, and I'm going to introduce you to our keynote speaker, um, who is um, an amazing man, and I've heard many good things, uh, Chuck Sperla, who served as the Assistant Commissioner for School Operations with the State Education Department since 2011, and has also served as the lead on the Regent State Aid Proposal for a number of years. Um, he served as Acting Deputy Commissioner for P-12 Education and was just appointed Associate Commissioner for the Office of P-12 School Services. So I'll leave it off to Chuck. <laughs> Good morning, and just slight correction, they actually appointed me uh, Deputy Commissioner. I'm not sure how much difference that makes, but uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, I'm very really happy to be here today. Uh, for somebody who's worked in uh, school finance and education for a long time, uh, like most of you, uh, I've been told more than once at uh, Easter dinner or Christmas dinner, uh, school finance is off the list of acceptable topics. <laughs> So, uh, although I do get a lot of, uh, I do get a lot of materials at, at those dinners, and uh, certainly education is, is not off the agenda at many of those topics, because uh, I feel that uh, since everybody I usually deal with has been to a school, um, there's a certain feeling that that makes them uh, feel that they're an expert, and for superintendents in the room, I'm sure that you have encountered a lot of uh, armchair superintendents or, or whatever they call them, and I'm guilty of playing that role myself. Um, I think it's really uh, important that we, we do get together um, because it's a, it's a time to reflect. As somebody who works in uh, a large organization, it's very easy to, uh, 
at times get surrounded with people feel something's a good idea, and then before you know it, everybody thinks it's a good idea. And um, you don't always have the time to kind of reflect or um, kind of develop a spirit of self-criticism where you kind of look at your ideas and say, okay, is it working, or uh, do we play devil's advocate? Um, going back to state aid for a minute, one thing that I always enjoyed with that group was there was that uh, uh, spirit of uh, self-reflection and self-criticism, and oftentimes people who presented an idea would tell you that uh, it felt like they had redefended their dissertation. And uh, it was also an interesting experience because after they got done feeling like they defended their dissertation, the group would say, you know, that was a really <laughs> great job that you did. And uh, people felt like, well, if it was so great, why couldn't you have said that to begin with? And the reason we couldn't do that is because sometimes you need to really push and probe and examine people's assumptions and, and try out your own assumptions. This um, symposium comes at a good time. Um, kind of one area I've been very involved with is kind of making the transition to what do kids really need to know in the 21st century that's often, you know, kind of bandied about what does it really mean. Well, I spend a lot of time uh, talking to employers and asking them what they want, and um, what they tell me is what they're looking for is, one, kids who come out of school and they have the ability to make decisions. Um, and by decision-making, they don't mean, okay, I've seen this problem before, um, I know what the right answer. That, that's really not a decision. It, it's akin to uh, those who in the leadership know that oftentimes you have to make decisions and you don't have all the information you need. And uh, that gets to be challenging. So decision-making is one. The second one we've all heard about this is innovation and creativity. Uh, critically important, and they want to see kids who come out of school with that. Another way I would describe it is one of the frustrations of employers is who try to make this shift is uh, we produce a lot of very smart kids who are good at taking tests, and they will go into the workplace, oftentimes after four years of college, and be given a challenging assignment, and after about five minutes, tell their employer, uh, I don't know how to do this. And, you know, the employer kind of shakes his head or her head and says, well, figure it out. And so by innovation and creativity, they're really talking in many ways about being able to figure things out. Um, another area is uh, being able to set goals and, and being uh, results-driven. You know, at the end of the day in business, they're not looking for somebody who, in essence, uh, has developed a, a car and it doesn't run, but it's a really nice car and it looks good. They're looking for something that actually works. And uh, an example of that would be uh, one of the programs uh, we've launched with uh, support of the legislature and the governor has been our P-TECH program. And the idea is it's a switch really to project-based learning where you get to apply your, your skills to real-world problems. So one of the problems the uh, P-TECH located Herkimer Fulton Montgomery Boses was uh, to deal with the problems with a soft ice cream machine which, you know, if you're a 16 to 17 year old, that's definitely a real world problem you can relate to. And the problem was many of these machines are older. Uh, the instructions have long since passed away somewhere. And so the kids were told that they needed to come up with a way to uh, produce the instructions for this machine. So they were creative and like most kids today, they had cell phones, so they came up with the idea of we're going to put QR codes on the machine, which if you don't know what those are, those funny-looking grids, and you hold your cell phone up, and it takes a picture of it, and the next thing you know, it gives you the instructions. But even better, uh, one of the challenges of this machine was that uh, it required loading from the top, and due to New York State's labor rules, which I don't totally understand, uh, you have to be 18 years of old, 18 years of age or older to load this machine from the top. So these kids came up with a way to kind of preload this thing with cartridges, and the next thing you know, the owner of this company was so happy he donated a soft ice cream machine to the kids. They considered that a success and far more meaningful than any grade they could have gotten on a test. Um, 
one that I often have questions about myself is multitasking, and I'm not sure what they, they mean by that. I don't think they mean the ability to text and email and drive a car at the same time on the New York State Thruway. Uh, what I think they mean is handling multiple priorities and doing them well. And then finally, um, and this is something I hear again and again, uh, work well with others. Uh, another way to put it is the ability to work in teams. And I can tell you from you know, my own experience, I, having you know, graduated during the uh, early Jurassic period, uh, we would get team assignments. And what I noticed the difference is when I got a team assignment, it was always an assignment that did not require a team which personally I found really frustrating, and some of you may have experienced, like, look, I'm just going to do the stupid assignment, and uh, please don't get in my way, let me do it. Uh, it's really interesting to see kids work on assignments that nobody has all the knowledge to solve the problem. And uh, you talk to kids, and it's like, so, working in a team make your, your product better. And uh, it's really interesting, everything from writing assignments to... Uh, building uh, mechanical devices, things like that. So that's kind of what our employers are telling us they want. Um, I have to admit, when I started with the department, if somebody said, I want to go talk to employers, they would look at you like, you're crazy. They will contaminate the process. They just want us to produce drones. Or as I had a conversation with one uh, gentleman one time, he told me what he was looking for as, uh, as a businessman. And it basically entailed, I want people with uh, basically the skills of someone who has a doctorate or in physics and is willing to work for six fifty an hour. And I told them, we just don't have a whole lot in common. Uh, that's not what I'm hearing today. Um, seeing some of these programs where kids are getting to do project-based learning, work in teams, uh, it's been really exciting because for the first time in like 30 years, I've heard employers say things like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, they said things like, I'm tempted to fire my frontline supervisors and hire these kids. I don't think because they're going to pay these kids less. So I think we are finally getting a connection with, with what people want. Uh, kids are excited in being able to use their brain. So how does that translate uh, even to the, um, to the earlier grades? Um, I was fortunate, and I had a lot of really excellent teachers, or I wouldn't be where I was today, and I'm extremely grateful. But uh, I thought one thing that was interesting was um, uh, I was at a present PTA presentation, and some teachers from Shenandoah were presenting. And um, you know, was, we talk about shift to the Common Core, which is really just saying we're going to shift to uh, uh, a set of standards. Uh, a, a lot of baggage that was attached had nothing to do with it. But I thought these teachers really kind of hit it on the head in terms of where we want to go to producing kids who are going to fit into the 21st century workplace. And they kind of talked about early in their career, uh, the traditional classroom, and some of us may be able to relate to this, was worksheets and packets. Uh, single approach to all problems was one way to do it. All the desks were in a row. You followed steps. Uh, a lot of it was based on memorization. And a phrase I hadn't heard, but I, I can relate to based on my study of French, is learn and forget. Um, and they contrasted that with what they're doing today, which is all about the use of manipulatives, which is a much better way to learn. Uh, technology in the classroom, multiple approaches to problems, uh, activity centers instead of sitting desks in a row, discovery, understanding and mastery. And so the good news is, of course, we've, we've had many teachers who have been doing this for many years. Um, so that's the good news. The, the challenge is that, um, and we've had prior symposia, they talked about all the challenges, the tax cap, uh, legacy costs, many of our small cities, uh, many of our large cities were really hit when, in essence, uh, the middle class moved out of those cities. Uh, left the retirement, retiree health care costs to the people remaining in those cities, moved to suburbs, started fresh, no legacy costs. Um, we have the aging of the teacher workforce. Uh, I know various um, researchers at uh, Rockefeller have kind of showed kind of this 
curve of teachers, and for a while, when they were retiring, it frankly made budgeting a lot easier because uh, you were replacing a lot of senior teachers, hiring new teachers, and uh, it freed up a lot of money. That has kind of leveled out. Uh, the number of um, retirees, the, the ratio of retirees to active teachers, has made it a real challenge. Um, and you know, increasing health care costs as a baby boomer myself. I don't think of myself as, uh, you know, it used to be when I was younger, being a baby boomer was associated with being young. Now being a baby boomer is associated with being old. And, and I don't particularly uh, like that, although I heard a comedian and he was talking about it. it can't be that bad to be old because, you know, all these old people get up at like 4 in the morning. They just can't wait to get going. Uh, as opposed to myself, I will die for an extra six minutes of sleep. Um, so that's been a, a big change. We've got these competing interests. So we have, we have a couple, you know, things we can do. We can um, sit around and whine about how great the good old days were when we were typically seeing 6 and 7% increases every year. And uh, occasionally I would look at uh, business official spreadsheets and... You know, it was simple. You, they just plugged in the numbers, and automatically it said, I'll make up whatever the shortcoming is in local share. Uh, that just doesn't work anymore. Um, these new project-based learning programs tend to cost more. We've got to put money in for professional development to work with our teachers. And the question is, where's, where's the money coming from? And uh, short of, of counterfeiting, uh, you know, the obvious solution is, are there ways we can reallocate resources? And you hear uh, later uh, from work that was done with uh, ELS and uh, eight of our school districts, several of whom are here today, you know, the theory was, okay, it, you know, everybody talks about you just need to reallocate your resources. Is it really possible? How much can be done? Um, you know, certainly I think additional resources are needed, but as numerous reports have seen, uh, have shown it's important not only to get the resources we need to provide the opportunities for all kids in the state, but are we using our money in the most effective way? And, you know, when I say effective, at times people will get defensive. We're not saying that people are uh, intentionally wasting money, but are there better ways to spend the money? And uh, I'm really excited to hear about what people have, have done to look at that. The other uh, certainly challenge in addition to 21st century skills, and we hear this from our Board of Regents all the time uh, as we've, uh, you know, identified some really great programs. How do we ensure all kids have access to those programs? And that is really the challenge. So on the one hand, we're a state that spends per pupil more money than everybody else. And uh, the question is, you know, what are we doing with that money? And, you know, well, some people might say, okay, we spend more money than everybody else. Let's just uh, cut our spending to be in line with everybody else. In terms of the enormous challenges we face, uh, I think it's a good thing that we make that kind of commitment to education. And if there are better ways to spend that money, then there's hope that we can get to the point where we're educating all kids. And I think with that, um, I'll leave it to hear from our experts on what advice they can give us. Thank you. So um, thank you very much, Chuck. That was wonderful. Um, I thought that ice cream machine was very interesting. <laughs> um, so just to note on our format today, um, each speaker is going to give their presentation. Um, if I can squeeze a few questions in uh, for myself, I am a reporter. Um, I will do that. And then once all of the panelists have spoken, we'll open it up to audience questions. Um, so be thinking of questions uh, if you have any that come up. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce um, our our beginning panelist, um, Jesse Levin, who's the principal research, um, oh, sorry, principal re research economist uh, with the American Institute for Research. So uh, thanks so much. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I haven't been in Albany since um, I was working with, uh, well, w working for Michael Rebell on the uh, 
on the uh, adequacy study that we did for the, the, the outcome of the campaign for fiscal equity versus the state of New York. So um, with that being said, let me give you just a little bit of background. Um, I am an economist, so don't hold it against me. Um, I'm not an educationalist, but I do have a background in economics of education. Um, uh, let me just put all these up here. Um, the things that I've been doing for the last 13 years since, since working with AIR American Institutes for Research are state-level adequacy studies, um, also uh, evaluation of state funding formulas, um, looking also not at just uh, equity and, 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 and adequacy ac across districts, but also looking at um, uh, intra-district equity and resource allocation, um, and uh, doing more general studies of, of expenditure and resource allocation at the, at the district of the school and at the individual level. So things like um, looking at uh, expenditures on early intervention services for, for, for uh, students with special needs. Um, so motivation for thinking about adequacy. I think Chuck really brought, brought a lot to light here. Why is this so important? Well, you know, education represents one of the most important investments that we can make. And it's been shown with several cost-benefit analyses that the, the rate of return to an investment in education is a very good one. Um, and not only to private individuals, but just society as a whole. So that's very clear. Um, the other reason is, we spend a lot on education. It's the second largest government outlay in the United States, second only to health. Um, so there, there's a lot of money being spent. We want to make sure that it's being spent wisely. Um, before moving on, I wanted to just get this off my chest and kind of what I'm going to do is bust the polarizing myths of, um, of educational inadequacy, okay? And this is, forgive me, but this is my uh, attempt at uh, PowerPoint theatrics, right? <laughs> so, okay, this, this poor soul here, he, he's saying, you know, there's just not enough funding. We're operating as efficiently as possible, but there's just not enough money for us to, to provide what, 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 what's being demanded of the education system. And on the other side, you have the camp that, that, that say there's, there's plenty of funding, there's more than enough funding, but you know what, it's just not being used efficiently. All right? Now, I don't subscribe to either one of those camps, or you could say I subscribe to both of them. In reality, I think that there are schools and districts on this continuum, and there's, there's truth to, to, to both of these. But if we subscribe just to one or other, it's very divisive and it's really polarizing the argument. A lot of this stems from, from lawsuits, okay? But if, if you can accept that really it sort of runs the gamut, that there are varying degrees of inefficiency and inadequacy in funding across the board, then we can just do away with this sort of all or nothing tenet that we can just spend our way solely spend our way. If we just spend more money, we're going to provide what's needed. Or we can deal with what we have, or even less, do more with the same or less. And, um, you know, so, so I just want to kind of throw those out. And, and clearly, I think something that we can all agree on is promoting efficiency in education is very, very, very important. And that's what we're all doing here and talking about today. And I will not be talking about adequacy um, in terms of funding adequacy, um, but I will be talking a little bit about what, I, what I've learned along the way in terms of um, trying to help schools and districts make efficient decisions. Okay? So the theatrics are over. There's no more of that. Sorry. Um, so in, in making resource allocation decisions, here are some of my perspectives of what I've learned along the way. Good decision making. Well, what does that involve? Well, it makes use of relevant findings from credible cost effectiveness research whenever possible. Now, what do I mean by relevant findings? There's a lot of research out there. Not all of it is applicable to every situation. So you have to be very careful about the, the, the studies that you're, you're um, basing your actions on. What do I mean by, by credible cost effectiveness studies? Well, two pieces to cost effectiveness. One are the outcomes. You want to make sure that the impact that you're calculating is truly attributable to, um, to the intervention that's, that, that, that's being performed. So um, you really want a tight study. And there's a lot of research that has been done on this, IES has supported um, the What Works Clearinghouse, and I, uh, oh, I forgot what they recalled it, but they, they, they've been trying to study this for, for years and trying to find, you know, um, studies that, that truly show causal impacts. That's the way we, we, we say it, and it just means that we're really sure that the intervention is responsible for producing the results. Now, the other side of cost effectiveness is the cost side. What do we mean by 
by, by cost, we want to understand the true comprehensive cost of delivering an intervention, all right? And you really have to have credible study, studies that can calculate the cost effectiveness, which is really the outcome that you're gaining per dollar spent, all right? Um, so, good decision making stems from a thoughtful planning and bu budgeting process. So, what, what do we mean by this? Something that involves a needs assessment, goal setting, um, resource allocation based on, uh, based on your needs assessment, goal setting, and any extant data you have on cost effectiveness. Um, it should involve stakeholder input. And then finally, there should be regular monitoring of your outcomes and modification of the plans. Okay? So if something is not quite working the way you thought it was, you try to update it. Incidentally, um, I, I, I just want to study for um, the, the program and policies, the policy and program service, uh, study service of the U.S. Department of Education, and it is focused on Title I schools. And they want to know how do Title I school-wide program schools differ from targeted assistance schools and uh, in terms of their resource allocation decision-making and the types of interventions that they implement with Title I dollars? Well, Title I school-wide schools are required to do a, pro a comprehensive program design that has all of these elements in it. And I would argue that it's not such a bad idea for all schools to engage in some sort of thoughtful planning budgeting process such as this. Um, so, what else? Um, schools and districts should take into account the trade-offs of employing different types of resources. And cost-effectiveness sort of bundles all of this up, right? Now, um, now when, I, when I say trade-offs, it's not only a trade-off in terms of the costs, but it's also a trade-off in terms of what is, what's the expected net outcome. If you divert resources from one, one purpose to another, how might it affect outcomes in net? It might, you might gain outcomes over here, you might lose outcomes over there. You want to make sure that, that, that whatever you're doing is cost effective. It's an improvement over what you've done. Um, finding the right balance between school and district discretion, right? Um, there are some services that it makes perfect sense to have centralized and, 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 uh, and, and delivered by districts. Other services, you might want to devolve that, 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 that um, discretion down to schools. Um, finally, maximize the flexibility with which funding is used. Uh, AIR has done studies showing that um, Title I schools, the school-wide schools, uh, often districts that have these schools will not pull together the Title I funding with other funding to try to leverage it and do much larger strategies, but rather they will coordinate it. So you have a pot of money over here that's Title I, you have a pot of money over here that's for your EL, it could be Title III or your state categoricals, and they're, they're not leveraging these funds. And, um, you know, I strongly suggest that, that, uh, that uh, districts try to look into this because they tend to be very scared of auditors. And there's actually a lot more flexibility they could use that they're not using. Um, and it, there's a, sort of a, set, a, a culture of compliance that has, ha, has, has grown around these categorical funding streams. Um, now, bad decision making. I'm going to punt on this one, but it fails to incorporate elements of the good decision making above, right? <laughs> Um, but here, here's, a good, here's a good example. It includes, you know, uh, uh, sweeping general allocation de decisions that are like in, 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 in the face of a budget cut, oh, we're just going to do a standard, you know, 10% budget cut across the board, all programs. That doesn't make a lot of sense, you know. Um, you really want to uh, be able to, uh, to, to, to figure out what seems to be working, not dismantle those programs, and get rid of um, the programs that don't seem to be giving you a, a bang for your buck. Now, how might um, research promote better resource allocation practices? I already discussed um, drawing upon rigorous research and cost-effective practices. Now, the problem with that is that extant research is not always available, relevant, or of, of sufficient quality. Okay? Um, so, what are some, some alternatives here? Oh, also, if you want to do your, your, your own cost-effectiveness studies, these take, these take a long time to do. So, um, often uh, districts don't have the time or policymakers don't have the time to conduct these things from scratch. Um, I would also argue, you know, often there's not the capacity um, to, uh, uh, the capacity, uh, the, the money, time, or even the uh, ability to, to conduct these studies on, on, on your own if you're a district. Um, so, I'm going to give, offer two, two approaches. One is a drill-down approach to identification of efficiency. 
This would, uh, th this is something that, that my colleague Bruce Baker from Rutgers and I um, are trying to promote. And this is um, sort of a, a backwards way of getting at efficiency. First, let's try to identify those um, schools that are most efficient. Uh, using cost, pro uh, cost function and production fr uh, frontier models, and th these are just pretty standard regression models that, that, that we use in research. And then to drill down and go into these districts and schools and do case studies and build very rich profiles of the resources that these schools use and um, do a comparative review by expert practitioners as well. And you can also compare what these schools are doing to what the best practices, the, the, the cost effectiveness literature says. Okay? A second way to do this might be to use a grow your own knowledge, or knowledge based approach. And what I mean by this is use the annual school and district planning slash budgeting cycle to um, to, uh, as a platform to collect and analyze this data on an annual basis. And you could try to identify, this is a more exploratory approach. And then you could see, you know, you can try to reconcile what's going on um, uh, in, in, in schools that, that, that look more effective in your district um, with, with uh, the, the uh, cost effective practices in the literature. So um, I'm not going to go over those, but final suggestions. Capacity, capacity, capacity. Um, I would, I would suggest partnering with researchers, there are a lot of really great academics out there, um, reputable research organizations, to build research capacity both at the state and at the LEA level. Um, next, you know, try to fund capacity building through some research grant dollars. The, the federal government has some research grant dollars that, uh, that, that it's, it's competitive, but if you team up with a, with a good academic or research organization, you know, you have just as much of a chance as anybody to do that. Uh, second, it takes a village. Okay? The quest for efficiency necessitates effort and input from multiple levels and should include commitment on the part of district leadership. This includes the superintendent, his or her cabinet, the board, um, active communication at the district level. This is personified by a, a marriage of the minds between CAOs and CFOs. Okay, really important. You have to have these two talking to each other to, 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 to really affect efficiency. Um, and then input and cooperation from school level practitioners and other stakeholders. That's it. I hope I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Thank you very much. Um, so next we'll hear from uh, <laughs> uh, next we'll hear from University at Albany Professor uh, Ham Flinkford. Thank you. This will in part give you a sense of my age, uh, but some of you may remember about 25 years ago. It may have even been 30 years ago. A co an economist named Hank Levin was here at the Rockefeller Institute and was talking about educational policy. This is Jesse's father. And uh, <laughs> I was going to say, that guy's a hack. <laughs> <laughs> and in, ter in terms of the dramatics, at that time, Hank came in with a cloak on <laughs> and was talking about the evils of, in, in education. So uh, they both have a flair. Uh, let me um, first say thank you very much for being here. And um, well, first let me start off making several observations. One is, is that there are big differences in teacher effectiveness. Not only across districts, between schools within districts, but also within schools. And that often is not understood, and it certainly is not reflected in policy, especially these intra-school differences. A second point is, is that teacher salaries and fringe benefits is the largest share of operating expenditure. So if we're going to make resources matter, we have to make dollars spent on teachers matter uh, especially. Uh, a third point is, is that it's extremely important, important that policies and practices be implemented so as to assure the most highly effective uh, workforce possible. And what that means is, is understanding, going back to my first point, there are all these big differences. And in carrying out policies, we need to address that issue. Now, there are a lot of policies that we can use, and very quickly, we can talk about recruitment and preparing teachers. 
uh, increased supply of effective, uh, potentially effective individuals, uh, teacher preparation. Uh, Tom mentioned that they're doing some uh, uh, work right now relating to this and improving the screening by preparation programs and hiring authorities. Um, I'll just go through this very quickly and I'll come back to these. A second point is improving the skills and performance of in-service teachers. A third is retaining effective teachers. Not all teachers, effective teachers. And finally, removing ineffective teachers. Now, these last two are things that until very recently were not discussed much. But going back to my first point earlier, it is crucial if we're going to make money spent on teachers matter more. Now, talk about making teacher, uh, uh, teaching as an occupation attractive. We need to increase the supply of people who would like to go into teaching, but at the same time, well, I'll come back to the second point in a minute, but we also need to structure benefits so that we retain the effective teachers. We need to be cautious about policies that say, well, let's retain more teachers. Let's do what we can to retain more teachers. We don't want to retain the ineffective teachers. We want to retain the effective ones. And so generic policies to increase teacher, uh, reduce teacher attrition may actually be counterproductive. Um, I'll talk, won't talk about this now, but I'll make the point. Uh, what I showed you just there was a teacher salary schedule. The structure of teacher salaries in New York State falls far short of the potential in terms of improving student outcomes. Uh, and the mistakes there are largely at the district level. Over many years, small incremental decisions have resulted in a salary structure that is, is detrimental to educational achievement. <coughs> Um, we need to help individuals uh, gain their full potential. Uh, we need evidence-based preparation. I'll hasten to say there's not a lot of evidence of what works best. But we also need to have evidence-based mentoring and professional development. There's some information here, but again, professional development needs to take into account that some teachers are much more effective than others and some may be effective in one thing and not another. So we need much more um, uh, nuanced professional development, individualized professional development than is often the case. Uh, and we also need incentives to perform better. Going back to the salary schedule, the, sa the schedules don't provide any incentives for people to uh, perform better. Uh, we need to evaluate effectiveness in screening, and I'll underscore screening here. We need to improve the, hi uh, 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 the screening of, um, by hiring authorities in who we hire. We spend relatively little uh, to uh, actually carefully screen. Now, I'll hasten to say that there's a limit to our ability to identify who will turn out to be the most effective teachers. But we can do better, far better than we currently do. The uh, other point is that we also need to uh, have screening in terms of teachers transferring. Uh, principals may want to, rather than force, you know, trying to uh, uh, force a teacher out of the system, pass them on to someone else. And there's clear evidence that ineffective teachers are more likely to transfer in large districts. And so that is important. But we also need a portfolio evaluation methods in rigorous and effective tenure reviews, APPR process, not only in terms of identifying the effectiveness of teachers, but then taking the hard making the hard decisions and actions that are needed to actually um, help individuals who are ineffective move on to other occupations. Now, there are a lot of different ways of measuring teacher effectiveness. There isn't one way. Value added, you know, it sees a lot of attention. Um, but classroom observations, not only by school officials, but individuals who are trained in, in, in these methods, who come from outside the school, even outside the district, so that we get multiple perspectives. Evaluations of principles, not just from classroom observation, but other information they have. Instructional artifacts, portfolios, even surveys have been used in certain places and provide some information. Now, New York State, 
um, doesn't allow some of this. But that doesn't mean that, that it's not a possibility if things change. But the point is there are multiple measures. And this important thing, each of these have issues of reliability and validity. That is, does the measure provide consistent results, one application after another after another? And secondly, do the measures actually get at the things we care about? We, the controversies relating to value added often result, in, you know, or related to folks talking about the reliability and validity issues. The same people that, you know, cast stones at value added never, often never talk about the same issues regarding these other measures. And if we're going to improve outcomes, we need to consider all these things. Um, it turns out that actually value added is also more reliable than its classroom observation. A second point is th these criteria should be used to consider all of them and not sort of, you know, talk about the problems of value added disregarding the alternatives. There are controversy here. One is the meaningful cost. Having a good evaluation system is not cheap. The second point is you're inevitably going to make mistakes. Some teachers who are in fact effective or, or moderately effective are going to be misclassified as ineffective and it will have you know, occupational consequences for these individuals. That's a real cost. Let me hasten to say that any evaluation system, whether I'm grading students, whether it's comprehensive exams and deciding whether people can go to candidacy for a PhD, um, any occupations where there are evaluation systems, you're going to make mistakes. At the same time, there are those mistakes, and this is the point that is far too little emphasized, is that there are potentially big benefits from this in terms of student achievement. When a principal or a superintendent is making this decision, Right in front of them is this individual that, that they're going to be evaluating and making personal decisions on. The stream of students who that person might well teach for a decade, two decades, or more uh, aren't at the table. But we need to consider the, the consequences for them. Now, if, um, if you um, think about the cost, uh, these statistics are helpful. What I did was I used New York data. I looked through the 2004 through 2007 or 8, and I looked at attrition of teachers from districts. And this is sort of the typical district in this state, sort of the average of the attrition rates by districts. And for newly hired teachers, on average, they stay eight years. And districts, on average, pay them a third of them, over a third of a million dollars. Now, at the tenure decision, on average, tenured teachers stay an extra 11 years. And on average, they're paid 540000 And that's not just salary, but fringe benefits as well. And for a teacher in their 10th year, they stay another 10 years, and it's $600,000. So in a tenure decision, where on average that person is going to continue to teach for 10 years and you're going to pay them 500, over $500,000, how much, how much in the way of resources should the district devote? I would argue that it needs to be substantial. Now, I don't have time to go through this example, but let me um, just sort of summarize. The point is, is that I sort of presented what I think is a reasonable case. It actually sort of reflects the what is being implemented in New York State. And I sort of say, well, what is the implications? And I want to show you a particular trade-off. And the trade-off is, is that basically in a, in a district having 100 teachers, if you implemented this kind of APR process, PPR process and actually carried through the consequences, basically, out of 10 ineffective teachers, you would replace 60% of them. But at the same time, you have these errors where other teachers would be misclassified and dismissed. This is what we often focus upon, and it is a big deal. But in the example, basically, you're reducing 54% of the ineffective teachers. And 
basically there's uh, a, over a, um, uh, 100 students that would no longer have an ineffective teacher who otherwise would have. So the point is, is that rather than focus just upon those few teachers who is dismissed, we need to take into account the large number of students who will benefit. And that would be benefits year after year after year. Um, and so this can be quite substantial. Um, I have to um, uh, finish up, uh, but let me just say a couple things in summary. One is there's a question of reliability. And I have the slides here has several examples where um, individuals who are classified as being ineffective and may well be dismissed uh, if, if you implemented these programs but aren't because the systems weren't implemented. We looked several years later in, at their effectiveness, and it turns out they're relatively ineffective later on. And there are big differences in, in these cases. The second thing is, we're talking about not just value-added estimates, estimates of teacher effectiveness. We're talking about other things as well. And it turns out that these, these measures um, actually um, uh, do foresee changes in performance. For example, in just uh, I'll finish with this. In New York, in Washington, D.C., they have a very aggressive evaluation system. And it has real consequences. They don't fire too many teachers, but it has real consequences in terms of salary and um, uh, uh, other things. And so you can say, well, these people that are designated as being ineffective, if you, they leave, do students' results actually improve? And a study by Jim Wyckoff and his colleagues at the University of Virginia actually show they do improve, and the improvements are substantial. That is, eliminating a teacher who is in this bottom two categories, on average results in an additional uh, four months of learning, of annual learning. Those are huge effects. So I'll end with that. Twelve minutes go too fast. Thank you. And we'll uh, continue to move it on a little bit. So we have uh, lots of time for questions at the end. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Michael Rebell, a uh, Columbia, Columbia University professor of law and education practices. Good morning. What I'd like to talk with you about today is um, cost methodologies, the um, approaches that uh, not only New York, but about 40 out of the 50 states have used over the last few decades to try to determine what is an a cost of an adequate education. Some of this, of course, has been driven by legal decisions. And as most of you probably know, um, over the last few decades, um, this practice has focused on four particular methods known as professional judgment, evidence-based successful schools, and cost function. Um, and uh, we haven't had any really innovations or new thinking in this area, I would say, uh, for the last couple of decades, and it's time that we do. And I'll tell you two major reasons why. Um, one is uh, that, as I mentioned, a lot of these came out of cost decisions. Uh, the aim is to come up with a constitutionally uh, responsible, compliant um, education funding system. Uh, and most of these, all of these um, methods, have basically ignored that fundamental requirement. So given my background as a lawyer, as many of you know, litigating the CFE case, and right now we have a follow-up case um, pending the nicer case in the uh, state Supreme Court. Uh, I am concerned about the extent to which the current methodologies don't respond to the constitutional parameters. Uh, but the second reason we need to rethink some of these methodologies uh, is precisely what Jesse Levin was focusing on, um, and I think that what, what we're here to discuss today, uh, they don't really um, uh, make use 
of the best available research uh, to focus their decision making. And uh, that's especially true of cost effective research, which is largely ignored, or if it's used in some of these methods, it's used in a very cumbersome uh, and awkward way, uh, not at all the fine-tuned approaches that Jesse was talking about. Um, so uh, I only have a few minutes, but I'm going to try to summarize uh, what um, I call a new constitutional cost methodology that responds to both of these needs. And by the way, I should preface these remarks by saying uh, I am being critical, uh, obviously, of the current cost methodologies, uh, but I want to put this in a certain perspective um, because um, uh, my sometime friend Rick Hanushek, as many of you know, has basically attacked all of these cost methodologies across the board. He calls them alchemy. Uh, that they're not scientifically precise. Um, and some of his criticisms are true. I, I share in some of them. Uh, but I want to put this in context. And that's what I always say when I'm on a panel or I'm debating Rick Hanushek. And that is, what are the alternatives? And the alternative to the present cost methodologies um, uh, or the improved one, what I think is an improved one that I'm going to talk about, uh, is the old um, political bargaining system. And we know it in New York State as three men in the room. Before we had any cost methodology approach in New York State, which really came to the fore during the CFE case uh, around uh, 2000, um, uh, basically decisions were made without any attempt at a methodology, without any real attempt at transparency, without any real attempt to focus on cost effectiveness or any of these issues we're talking about. Um, and it was basically how much money is available, how much money are we going to throw at education this year, and some backroom bargaining about who's going to get more of it and who's going to get less. Not focused on children's needs. And that is the bottom line constitutional requirement that the Court of Appeals has spelled out in New York State, that any cost methodology has fundamentally got to be based on student need. Uh, but I'm adding cost effectiveness to that equation. Um, some people may find this strange for somebody who's been a plaintiff attorney on this. But I do recognize that funds are not unlimited. Uh, we do think kids have rights to certain services. They have the right to a sound basic education, everything that means. Um, but they don't have a right to a certain number of dollars. So if those constitutionally required services can be provided more cost effectively, uh, that is satisfactory from my point of view. And it's politically, obviously, uh, much more feasible uh, because um, you get much less resistance to doing what's the right thing and meeting kids' needs. Okay, so what is this new approach to cost methodology that we're working on? And I do expect to spell this out in more detail and come out with a, a much more uh, extensive uh, explanation of it in the next few months. But in summary, it starts from the premise that the outcomes that you're going to look at in developing your cost methodology uh, basically have to be the outcomes that the courts have said are the purposes of public education. In New York State, the Court of Appeals emphasized preparing kids to be capable citizens and preparing them to be productive workers. Now, Chuck just gave us uh, a very uh, complete explanation, not complete, uh, a very interesting, and I hope to hear more of it com to be complete, uh, analysis of what the state's trying to do in terms of CTE, career preparation. We know most school districts are way behind the eight ball on this. What's interesting is our current cost methodologies don't take that into account at all. They focus on uh, scores on, on standardized tests, reading and math, essentially. So uh, what a school may or may not be doing for career development, how much that cost, Chuck indicated there are large costs involved, doesn't come into the equation at all. So some of these major goals that the courts say are constitutionally required are being ignored, and they shouldn't be. That should be up front. As far as inputs, uh, most of the methodologies use either statistical methods or professional judgment or some kind of evidence, but as Jesse indicated, uh, very often not comprehensive, peer-reviewed, uh, best evidence. Um, it's partial. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily looking at all the resources that kids need, all kids, to get a sound basic education. 
again, looking at requirements in New York State, the courts in, in the CFE case spelled out seven particular resource areas, starting with highly qualified teachers, going to appropriate instructional equipment, extra platform of services uh, for kids with extra needs. Um, all these areas have to be covered. And I think it's, it's a uh, checklist that should be required. I think it will structure uh, what uh, the cost methodology is looking at. We cover many of those things, but not all of those things in the present approach to it. Um, uh, we also uh, would make use of commissioner's regulations in this process. The commissioner's regulations in New York and some statutes spell out in operational detail some of these constitutional requirements. What is a qualified teacher? Uh, what kind of instructional materials need to be used? Uh, what kind of programs and a platform of services? A lot of this is spelled out in the commissioner's regs, but again, our cost methodologies don't take that into account in the way we analyze the costs. And systematically, we need to do that. I think that needs to be built into the methodology. Now, as far as cost effectiveness and use of best evidence and practices, uh, what I just want to bring to your attention uh, to start a conversation on this is there are uh, sound methods that a few states have been using that essentially do the kinds of things that Jesse Levin was talking about. And I'll give you an example is Oregon that has something they call the quality education model. Uh, and this is a systematic way to build uh, best practices evidence and thoroughgoing cost effectiveness mechanisms into the cost methodology approach. This is a standing committee. It's been in existence since 1999, uh, set up um, through state statutes. And every two years, this commission meets and reviews the evidence that its staff and the state education department have put together on particular issues that the commission has asked them to study over that two-year interval. So, for instance, uh, in their last cycle, they looked closely at teacher collaboration, its effectiveness, best practices. Uh, their 2014 report focused on services uh, for kids with extra needs, and they surveyed the What Works Clearinghouse. They surveyed the best evidence around the country about what works. Uh, they looked at cost-effective practices. Uh, I also want to bring to your attention Washington State. Uh, Washington um, has a, uh, an institute for public policy that systematically does cost-effectiveness analyses of the types Jesse talked about and pass that on to the legislature, pass that on to the state education department uh, to work into their cost mechanisms. So I think uh, we can build a structure like this with a standing commission that has a staff that utilizes state ed and other resources in a very focused systematic way uh, to look at best practices, to look at cost-effective te te techniques. We're trying to think through exactly how that would work, and um, since Hank Levin's good name has already been mentioned, Hank, as you know, is now a professor at Teachers College where um, I'm on the faculty, and uh, I've been working with Hank um, uh, to try to adapt the best of these models from Oregon, from Washington, from What Works Clearinghouse into a systematic way that we can build a methodology in New York State that is research focused and that also uh, is very sensitive and adherent to the constitutional requirements that our Court of Appeals has set up um, in the CFE case. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and lastly, we'll, ha we'll hear from Shane Cavanaugh, the uh, Government Finance Officers Association Senior Manager of Research. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, um, I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with the Government Finance Officers Association, but as the uh, Senior Manager of Research from an organization with a name like that, you can imagine I am well acquainted with what the Deputy Commissioner said earlier. Public finance is usually not a topic for polite conversation. So I'm happy to be here with you guys so I can talk all about this sort of thing. 
So what I'm going to talk about is a program that the GFOA has been working on for the last two years called the Best Practices in School Budgeting and Smarter School Spending. So I hope you liked Jesse's PowerPoint theatrics because you're about to get a lot more of that. Um, the first kind of there's three elements to this system, the best practices in school budgeting and smarter school spending. So the best practices, if you're familiar with what GFOA does, one of the major things we do is kind of soft standard setting, I guess you could say. We develop these things called best practices with a capital B and a capital P that carry a lot of weight within the profession. So we have been developing these best practices in school budgeting, which are kind of developed in the form of a process that school districts can follow to uh, best align their limited resources with their instructional goals. Kind of going along with these general guidelines is a website called Smarter School Spending that has been developed over the past few years with a four pilot districts that has a lot of really detailed tools to help you implement these guidelines kind of on a day-to-day -day practice level. And then lastly, there's an award program that goes along with all of this. So if you want to participate in an award program and be recognized for your efforts for developing this new budget process, you have the opportunity to do that. And all these things are tied together by these five core concepts that really characterize the budgeting method that we advance, and that is there's a planning preparer. So before you kind of develop a new budgeting method that's going to you know, rock the boat on how resources are allocated, you need to get ready to do that. So that involves, I think, uh, Jesse mentioned the idea of uh, having a partnership between the finance group and the academic group. So in our pilot projects, we had about 10 total pilot projects. Um, that has proven hugely important and one of the actually favorite elements of this method amongst our pilots. They really like this idea of cooperating more with each other. They weren't, you know, at war before, but they kind of operate, I have the metaphor I've heard them say, we are kind of walking down the same street, but one person of defiance on one side, academic on the other side, let's walk down the street hand in hand together towards the same goal. Uh, next is set instructional priorities. So this is kind of, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So kind of figure out what do we want to do as a district so we can then pay for those priorities, like implement or kind of allocate the resources to do those things. And then we want to implement the plans is allocate the money through your budget process, then finally ensure sustainability. So this gets to the point of making sure there's not a one and done type of situation. This becomes a way of life for the organization where you're always looking to figure out how do we align our limited resources with our educational goal. So what I'm going to do as part of my presentation is boil this down to the really core elements that we've identified through our pilot projects. There's kind of a ton of content that's part of all this, but given the kind of 10 minutes I have left, I'm going to get right to the essence. So first is kind of setting your smarter goals. We call them smarter goals. The idea being here is you have to have some pretty clearly defined goals that are going to orient the whole entire process. So if you start out with a, what these characteristics mean, a specific goal would be, for example, the goal would be to increase the number of third graders reading at grade level. Next, it has to be measurable. So we might say that, all right, we're going to use a test, and we want to have, uh, let's say, 70% of our, or let's go with 80% of our children reading at grade level in third grade, so now that's measurable. Is that achievable? So the next question is, if you've got, like, say, 30% reading now, getting up to 70%, 80%, and 90%, probably not achievable, probably not a realistic goal. Probably not going to be super useful for guiding intelligent and informed conversations of how to get there, so pick something that's kind of a little more grounded in reality. Relevant. So this is an important point, is that a goal needs to really or, or be oriented towards the child's ability to succeed in life, not so much level of effort. So, for example, a goal that is built around class sizes is really getting at the level of effort that goes into educating children and not really what you're getting out of it. So we advocate that your goals be uh, really oriented more towards the difference that you're going to make in the student's life, such as the ability to read. Time bound, so have a time frame on these goals. Exciting, so if you're, let's say, your goal is 70% and you're at 69% right now, a goal of 70% not exciting, uh, it's really not going to inspire action or, you know, like really make any real change. And then resource to align these finances with goals. So what I'm going to do now is show you the uh, Lake County, which is in our pilots, Lake County in Florida, how they actually did this in real life. So what we've got here is some more PowerPoint theatrics. So up at the top, you've got their major goal, immediate investment in struggling students. That's kind of a little vague, so let's make that more specific. So they have a sub-goal of let's uh, help our ELL students in particular, so that adds some precision to their major goal. Next, what is the need? So that's this goal of investing more in ELL students. The need for that may not be immediate, immediately relevant to all stakeholders in the district. So you know, let's explain that, because not everyone has the same level of knowledge that we do as to why we need to do certain things in our district. 
Kind of moving on to the next slide is what will the district do? So this is kind of achievable. So in their case, they've put out a few kind of clear steps that they can take to realize this goal. So the point being is, well, let's set out the small baby steps we can take to get there to kind of show people that this is something that is realistic for us to accomplish. Now we've got what will it cost. So in the GFWA method, we advocate a longer-term time horizon than three years. So kind of cool, I found an article from 1936 that was actually talking about the need for a long-term uh, perspective on school finance decision making, the idea being that school kind of instructional reforms usually take multiple years to bear fruit, so if the funding is all over the map, it's going to be very difficult to make the sustained investment in those programs necessary to move the needle on student achievement. So a three-year time horizon begins to give people a sense of the commitment that's going to be required to meet this goal. Then lastly is what districts is the gain or what gains does this district expect? So measurable time bound and exciting is represented here, where they've got clear measures, they've got clear uh, years for the achievement, and they're looking to go from 61 to 90 percent. So that's a pretty big jump. You know, I would say that qualifies as exciting. So after you have these goals in place, the kind of next step in this essence, the kind of the if you'd say the kind of essence of our process is root cause analysis. And so this is a uh, panel on research. So I'd like to give you some of the research that goes into this. We are the uh, Government Finance Officers Association. So as you might imagine, we're not really getting a whole lot into instructional and curriculum research. But we, what we do do is research on decision making and how to make better decisions with your resources. So who here is a show of hands familiar with the concept of cognitive biases and decision making heuristics? So like a few people. So basically what this is, is over the last number of years, uh, cognitive scientists have found that people are not rational decision makers, surprise. But what they are is they do use a number of mental shortcuts and other tendencies to make the decision. So one of the most important ones is overconfidence. So to give you an example, in surveys, 80% of people believe that they're wealthier, healthier, smarter, better looking, and better drivers than average. So let that sink in. Uh, mathematically, probably unlikely. Here's a maybe less funny one, maybe more sobering. A study took a group of doctors that were all completely certain their diagnosis. Turns out with the test being done, 40% of them were wrong. That's overconfidence. Uh, another famous study Philip Tetlock did, kind of a study of social scientists who were considered experts in their field, asked them to make predictions about their field, studied the results of their predictions over time. Results no better than random chance. So this is they, that's overconfidence in action. And so how this happens in a school district is, or any really decision making, budget decision making situation is, we assume that we know more than we actually do about how things work, so we may be overconfident about the efficacy of the interventions we're going to make in students' lives. So the point of root cause analysis is to cause people to start to question those assumptions up front before you start making these investments. So I'm going to show you a little example. This is from another real-life school district. This is from Beaverton, in Oregon. And so they, the kind of problem they were dealing with here is they have only one-third of their eighth graders are meeting the uh, state standards for math tests, and these are one-third of eighth graders who receive the special education uh, in the district. So first question is, why are a few eighth graders meeting the state standards? Answers are not prepared to meet the standards. All right, let's drill down to the next question. Why are they not pre prepared to meet the standards? They lack access to the appropriate instruction grade level content. Drill down one more time. Why are they not in general ed class where they can get this content? And the general ed teacher may not have the skills or the abilities to uh, serve the special education students. So moving on, why do the general ed teachers then not feel prepared to instruct these students? And that's because the professional development for the general education teachers may not actually support how to instruct the students with the special education needs. And then why is professional development not addressed this is because the budget for professional development for, to support special ed students is provided exclusively by the special education department, which only trains those teachers. So you can see there's a disconnect there of who controls that budget and who needs the training. So the conclusion that Beaverton reaches, we need to redo our budget process so that we're not in these sorts of silos and these training dollars are available to the teachers that need them. So kind of out of this kind of goal setting and root cause analysis, you're going to generate a number of ideas for how to improve the instructional practices of your district. You're going to need to pay for all those somehow. So kind of our assumption, operating assumption, this method is you're not going to have a whole bunch of money lying around to pay for this stuff. So our, we have kind of boiled it down through a whole bunch of research to 31 top money-saving ideas for school districts. So on our website, you can get these 31 ideas, and then we provide a number of filters that you go through to identify the small number of ideas that will give you the best shot to save the money to pay for your instructional priorities. All right, so what are we doing now? I'm just going to wrap up with kind of, all right, well, what are we doing with all this information? 
So we are into our kind of first wave of early adopters. I mentioned earlier we had 10 pilots that have been successful, so we're now to our first wave of 35 early adopter school districts across the country. This is called the Alliance for Excellence in School Budgeting. So they we're actually meeting next week in Chicago. We're having our kind of inaugural in-person kickoff meeting with the 35 districts, both finance and academic people together. So a very important point is both have to participate in this equal. It's not just a finance thing. Uh, we're starting to get results from our pilots, so this is kind of exciting. So Wiley, which is our, des our Wiley ISD, I should say, our district in Texas, uh, highest state or growth in test scores in the entire state in Texas, uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, district of 15,000 kids. Beaverton, Oregon, uh, highest growth in test scores of any district in the state in Oregon, so that's also pretty good. That's 40,000 kids. Uh, unless you think this is just about the um, oh, Rochester, this is a local example, Rochester, New York. So they're one of our pilots, and they've been able to increase in structural time 18 to 30 percent by making some reforms. And then lastly, DeSoto Parish in Louisiana, 5,000 kids. So as a result of following these methods, they've gotten their bond rating increased to a double A. So this is not just about doing the instructional things right. It's about doing the finance things right as well. So this is going to be a sustainable program going forward, not a flash in the pan. And so if you've got any questions, this is everything you might like to know. I'll also be around afterwards if you want to chat. Um, so these you can, real quickly, uh, Smarter School Spending is a detailed site that has all the tools on it. And this GFA org K-12 budget is more generalized information. So either way, um, but thank you for your time. I'm just going to get one quick question in um, from myself with uh, Shane here. Um, you talked a little bit about some of the school districts um, that were part of this um, study, and there were 10 school districts. Is there um, a kind of school district that's best suited to this model? Can it be used for all school districts? Sure. Great question. Uh, thanks for asking that. So um, this is like a lot of detail to our piloting and dissemination strategy. So we've kind of identified right now that like, if you had to pick a sweet spot, it tends to be between 10,000 students and 60,000 students. But as you heard, DeSoto Parish is 5,000. We have one nuts in our group now that's 1,000 students. So it can definitely go below that and it can go above it, but that would be kind of the sweet spot that we've identified. And the way we're structuring our alliance for school budgeting is we're kind of, to adopt a new idea, it's not everyone's going to do it at once. You need to find this core group of innovators, and they're going to spread it from there. So a great example is in Oregon, the Beaverton uh, School District. They've been actually talking to other districts in Oregon. So there's now four districts in Oregon that are interested in doing this. So it's kind of we're looking for an, or an organic model of growth. So if each one talks to two others, then it will eventually spread. So that's kind of the, the approach that we're looking to take. Thank you. And, um, and one more quick question just that came to mind um, between yours and uh, Hamp, uh, Hamp, so I'll open it up to whoever wants to answer it. But it sounds like um, a lot of the research is showing that teachers um, are a main part of this. You need to have effective teachers, and how do you go about doing this? Um, how do you not only bring in but retain good teachers? Any, either of you? <laughs> Well, you know, that's a challenge. Um, I alluded to this earlier. One thing, you, you structure compensation so that it actually gets the biggest bang for the buck. We have a system now that doesn't do anything to retain effective teachers uh, relative to ineffective teachers. And so in some sense, you can think about just money being left on the table or put in the wastebasket if, if the goal is to improve the quality of teaching and teacher outcomes. Leadership is important. Peers are important. And so there's a whole, you know, it's, it's not just pecuniary and uh, benefits and, and uh, fringe benefits. It's having a good work environment uh, uh, that can make it, and leadership is extremely important. Uh, so there's a variety of things that have to be done. Uh, and in fact, in general, it's not there's no civil bullet. What you need is success by a thousand or hundreds of of of, achieve, of successes, and they can be small. So, so it isn't one thing. Okay. Thank
Thank you. Um, now we'll open it up to audience questions. We do have a microphone going around, so if you could just raise your hand, and I'll point to you, and then we'll have the microphone. Please wait for the microphone to get to you uh, so that the recording, uh, everyone can hear what has to be said. And uh, just a reminder to say your name, your title, where you're from. I want to hear from you. Any questions? And these can be addressed to any of the panelists, or all of the panelists. Uh, Chuck? <laughs> Hi, I'm still Chuck Sabrow. I'm still a deputy, uh, hopefully. Uh, question for the researchers. One of the challenges is that, uh, you know, kind of as experts, as researchers, we tend to do things in silos. And so when we present best practices, we kind of often present the good news, but don't present oftentimes what can be the challenging news for implementation. So a lot of great ideas, but oftentimes they come with a political price and kind of to grossly exaggerate, you know, we've seen some experiments in American foreign policy where I would say democracy is a great form of government, uh, but simply saying, okay, it's a best practice, why don't you implement it in any given country doesn't necessarily work out. And uh, any thoughts you have on, you know, maybe research teams should be broader to include more of the social sciences and not just, uh, here's something that worked in District A, uh, but we'll leave out the fact that, uh, you know, the superintendent had a bruising battle to get these things implemented. Once they're implemented, they work great, but uh, people ought to go into implementing the practice with uh, a sense of what it might take. I'll go first since I talked a lot about District A. <laughs> so um, the what we're doing in that regard is we're doing detailed case studies of those districts I put up there. So the Beaverton one will be available actually next week to members of our alliance. So and then to the broader public after that. But the point being, it gets into you know all the battles that had to happen. So I'll give you a good example. Um, there was a lot of funding cuts. We didn't had to cut a ton of things out. Uh, music was one of those things that had to go. They wanted to then figure out, well, how do we add things back in that are the most cost effective? And, you know, I'm, I'll let these guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that music is the most cost effective way to increase graduation rates or increase, uh, close the, the learning gap. But regardless, there were kids at the council meetings playing their instruments like for the whole year and that sort of thing so a lot of political pressure so they gave in you know they said all right you know this public budgeting is a compromise you know if we want to get a budget that everyone can support we need to put back the music even if it isn't necessarily the best you know most cost effective thing we could be doing with our money to close the achievement gap and increase graduation rates there's other things that that kind of alleviating that pressure then gave them the latitude to do so that's been our approach anyways, is to kind of really get in the details and kind of share some of those in a kind of story format that will allow for learning by other practitioners. Um, Chuck, your question uh, allows me to flesh out a point that I, I didn't have time to reach, which this course methodology we're talking about is going to really focus on uh, inputting uh, very systematic, uh, extensive research, but it still uses professional judgment panels and also public engagement processes to get the kind of reactions from those who have to implement it, those who have to pay for it, uh, before it's filtered through to this commission that makes the ultimate recommendations to the legislature. So let me just touch on this a little bit. We were talking about this before before this all started today, and, and one of the one of the mantras is that really research should not really um, should really inform policy. It you know you, re research can't tell you exactly what to do, and, and some of the dangers uh, is using research that is not completely externally generalizable. It doesn't apply everywhere to um, specific contexts, and, and that can be actually very dangerous to do. So you, you never. You never want to do that. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, in terms of being a researcher and working, whether it's with policymakers or districts or schools, um, whenever we come to it, we don't like to be perceived as consultants. We like to go in and say, we're going to work with you, and we're going to help you find solutions for yourself and try to build the capacity so you can sustain these. Um, we, we never want to make slaves uh, of the districts to our services, or I, I never want to. Um, so, so I, I think that it's really, really important that, uh, that 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 we don't try to come up with these one-size-fits-all approaches, um, which dictate policy. Rather, we should try to inform policy and then figure out in each district what will work there. Um, uh, 
you know, when, when we're doing our professional judgment approaches for, for these adequacy studies, so I promise I wouldn't say anything about adequacy, but here we are. Um, we, we had a, an acronym that we would work with the panels called GEAR, G-E-E-R. And the first was, was goals. Will your, your specifications, your research model, models that you're, or your resource models that you're putting together reach the goals? Um, e was, was effectiveness, are, are they going to, um, ef or, sorry, efficiency, are they going to reach the goals at a minimum cost? The next E was um, evidence-based. Is there any evidence-based for this? And then finally, the R was relevant, could, or realistic, sorry, um, realistic. Could, the, could, could your specification realistically be implemented here? That was trying to get, to try to get away from the sort of, you know, pie in the sky model. Yes, the, the teacher's lounge needs, you know, gold-plated hot tubs, things like that. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. So, so we tried to go through that, but, but one, one of the ideas there is not only to keep it honest, but to keep it context specific, right? And um, that's the danger of trying to do a one-size-fits-all or depend on uh, research evidence that is cherry-picked and either isn't rigorous or generalizable to your case. So I just wanted to put that out there. Just a quick point. Um, going, those of you who know my research, uh, going back to the CFE case and, and even earlier work, um, we focused a lot on the distribution of the teacher workforce across districts and schools. And, and the point here is, is that there are big differences in the settings in which schools and districts find themselves. And so a cookie cutter approach won't work. And you need to take those differences into account. Now the generic points that I made are true, are, are, are applicable to all of them. But what the most important challenges are and the best strategies will differ from place to place. Question here. Oh, hold on. We want to capture it for the recording. So um, I came today, hope, oh, I'm Sue Adler, and I'm a school board member in the city of Albany. I, I came today uh, to see if, thank you for the little applause, um, it's, I know it's very highly, my position is very highly paid, um, so that's why we do it. Um, I, I came today not expecting a magic bullet, but I actually expected something a little more, and let me explain why. Um, I've been in the school board five years now, done a lot of research, and um, read a lot, and thrilled to see Mr. Abel here and the work he's done. But a number of the things you all said seemed extraordinarily theoretical, seemed to avoid the elephant in the room, at least as what uh, a city district like ours. And there's, uh, I'm, I'm at a loss for what to take from it, so what I'm, I want to explain quickly is there's a teacher shortage in New York State. Uh, whether that is chicken egg on high stakes history or not is relevant. Um, 540,000 across 10.2 years when you amortize that because it's salary and benefits. 54,000 is not a lot each year to pay a teacher who the first person speaking, Mr. Levin, referred to, or maybe the second did, the person from Sue Albany, uh, as to the most, one of the most important things we do is educate children in our, in our world and our society. And that's quite a bizarre number to place on what you consider to be the most important or second most important work. Um, so with high stakes testing, with the difficulty what I see um, as a 58-year-old person and a school board member is that as poverty has increased, so has uh, the expense of teaching students because when I was a student, Nobody had to actually provide me with behavioral specialist work. I came from an intact family. I didn't have trauma. Somebody wasn't shot on the street down. The, down we didn't have lockouts or lockdowns and all of that. But I live in a city, and I'm proud to live in a city where all of this is a reality. So if you expect us to be able to put out good citizens and not drones or automatons and not cut the things that put bottoms in seats like sports and music, I would love someone to help me understand exactly how, if you're not talking about about gap elimination, and if you're not talking about the disparities in foundation aid, how we as a city school district are supposed to educate students when we have to be parents patriotic to them and everything else while dealing with people who are under siege in all of our stakeholder groups. I know it can't be answered quickly, but I, I just say that when we're talking about school resources matter, 
I'm not talking about every district where when your kid wants to do something extracurricular, if they can't get music in the schools, you can give them free piano lessons because you can pay for them. Um, this is a very, this is a, I, I would like to see some way of approaching some of the most difficult issues in our time. And I, I really think we avoid it and go around it and never really address the most difficult problem, and that is the poverty in our midst, which schools are now left to pick up and try to solve. Can I respond to that? I, I want to just uh, quickly say that uh, I, for one, am responding to the gap elimination and the um, poverty needs. Um, I mentioned the nicer lawsuit. Uh, we have a motion for summary judgment that's going to be argued November 4th. I expect a decision not too long after that. And what we're asking the court to do, essentially, is respond to current needs. Uh, I mentioned these cost methodologies. The ones in place now were done 10 years ago. Um, they don't take into account all the things that you've said. That's just one part of the picture that I think the state has to focus on these things, and we're looking for a court order to make them do that. Uh, let me just make one point. When I was talking about teacher salaries and, the, you know, the, the large numbers, I was not questioning whether or not teacher salaries were too high. My point was is that we're spending a lot of dollars. And if given that, we should spend somewhat more so that we make sure that those dollars are as well spent as possible. Uh, I am an advocate for well-compensating teachers, but we need to do it in a way that we improve outcomes. Do we have another question? Yeah. Patty's over there. I just have a follow-up to that question, which I think is interesting. It's for Michael, because I'm intrigued about a different approach to uh, estimating the cost of providing a meaningful high school education to all of our students. And my question is, you talked about cost effectiveness, you alluded to um, knowledge about success successful programs for at-risk students. How is evidence on those programs incorporated, or how would it be incorporated in this cost model? Uh, okay, well, what I was uh, saying is we're looking very closely at these models from uh, Washington and Oregon, where um, a standing commission um, is in a constant dialogue with extensive uh, research, with extensive research opportunities, people who really um, uh, are looking uh, at uh, the best research, the best practices in the state, throughout the state. And every two years they modify the course methodology based on those inputs, based on inflation, other factors. Um, so that gives you a permanent, stable, research-oriented method for uh, making sure your costs are relevant. And, uh, you know, the kind of information that I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name from the Albany School District, was bringing up, um, we're 10 years out of date in our cost methodology in New York State. That shouldn't happen. Uh, we should be up to date, and we should be up to date with the best research and the best possible input. So that's really what we're looking for on this. Yes, over here. Uh, thank you. I'm um, uh, Assembly Member Kerry Warner. I represent uh, Saratoga and Washington counties uh, in the Assembly. And, and Michael, my question is for you. The, um, there are, in creating a cost model, one of the things that I observe about how we t currently fund schools is that there are radical differences between the challenges faced in a rural environment versus an urban environment. Uh, some of the some of the issues are similar as the last questioner suggested, which is that many of our schools deal with uh, problems of poverty that have nothing to do with education per se, but the, the land and the classroom and the teachers have to deal with them. So in the, in the funding model or the approach to developing a funding model that you're suggesting, states like Oregon and Washington don't have the diversity of communities that a state as large as New York does. How, how, would, you take in, how would you propose to take into account the, the, the diversity that we find in our communities between deeply rural, densely urban, 
and then of course the, the range in between. Yeah, that's a very good question. One of the criticisms I have of the current methodologies, and many other people do too, is they generally do put in weights for kids from poverty backgrounds, ELL kids, um, sparsity factors for rural districts, but um, uh, they tend to use very arbitrary computations on these weights, which often are based on averages from the literature, and the literature is based on the average states throughout the country, which are usually politically bargained uh, notions that have no relation to any real thorough evidence on how much you do need to bring in all these factors to deal with poverty kids. Um, so what we're looking for is an actual cost orientation. And, you know, I'm saying we're looking to Washington and Oregon because we think their method of having a standing commission that regularly relates to a, a research, fact, a research um, function is the way to go. But obviously the research we would do in New York State would be a lot different from whatever they've been doing in Oregon and would uh, presumably focus on all of these um, factors and not give us that we're going to increase the weight for ELL or poverty by 25% or 100% or whatever as an abstraction. We would say to look at all these factors you have to look at, and I agree with you, some of them have to be health factors, um, they have to be um, uh, so, uh, increased social supports and all. Um, how much does that cost in actual dollars? And then you build a percentage into the formula. And as far as differences between rural districts, upstate, downstate, our current formula does have a cost of living index as a way of dealing with that. It may not be the best way. So I'm saying we, we need to examine these things, and if we examine them on a regular basis, I think we're going to do a much better job than having done it once 10 years ago in the middle of a litigation and then forgetting about it um, for the next decade. Uh, he's Thank you, he's all of you, for your... Yeah, he has another comment. If oh, you understand. Just, just really quickly, I mean, any, any credible, that, that's a great question, and any credible costing out study should take into account uh, scale of operations. It's one of the three main cost factors that drive education. There are student needs, there are scale of operations, and there are differential prices of of inputs in, in, in various geographic markets. Um, so the, the, the study that we did with you, Michael, we, we most certainly did. We recruited panelists from um, four different types of districts across the state, going from, from New York City, their, their own animal, um, to the, the other big four cities, to sort of more suburbs, to to rural, and our panelists were all from, from different districts, but of the same type. And we tried to ask them, we said, here, here is your educational goal, that this is what we want from the, 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 uh, the, 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 the public education system for, for students. What, what are you going to do to deliver that goal in terms of develop a program from the ground up? And, 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 and spec out the resources, and then we would cost it out. And as you might imagine, with all of these panels, they were doing exercises with different hypothetical schools. And we had this variation in costs of providing an adequate education with respect to poverty, EL, um, scale of operations, et cetera. So, so an excellent question, and um, I, I guess I want to just double on what Michael said. I don't think Michael was, was saying that that you would adopt models that are put into play in, in Oregon or, or Washington, because by no means would those be generalizable to the, the case of New York. But the approach that they're taking to have a standing commission to look into this, that is something I think Michael is a proponent of. We'll take one last question over here. I'm an interested senior citizen. I'm a former teacher, and I have served on the Board of Cooperative Educational Services. Uh, I now devote my attention to 18 grandchildren in, in oh, Sally, Pierre Burning, uh, in many different school districts, private and public. Uh, and I just wonder, I guess this is addressed to the researchers. Do you have research on the correlation between participation in music and or athletics and its impact on student success. I, it seems that, and rightly so, you're focusing on core math and uh, English, 
But if you look at the goals of producing capable citizens, multitasking, ability to work in teams, creative problem solving, it seems to me that the peripherals should not be overlooked. And I hope that is somewhere being researched. I, I don't have an answer for you, but, but I, I agree with you, and I, I'm not sure I, I, I have to talk to Shane a little bit about his, his contention. I, I think um, in terms of not only these additional skills that, that music and arts and a lot, a lot of these subjects that suffered under No Child Left Behind, quite frankly, um, uh, in, in addition to, to that, I, I mean, I think that there's a motivation for keeping, keeping those types of subjects alive in that it's keeping a certain po subpopulation of students in school, right? Keep, keeping them coming to school and perhaps preventing some dropout. I don't have any research for you, but um, I, I'm very interested in that and, and, and think that it deserves. I'm, I'm sure there, there has to be something out there. Sure, and let me clarify, I'm not saying that um, music or other sorts of extracurriculars or what have you are not valuable. So that if the goal is to increase graduation rate or to, in Puritan's case, close the gap between their kind of very significant population of in poverty students and their non poverty students, they have to look at all the different options they have. And according to kind of what they looked at, there were things that they thought would make a bigger difference than music, and they have to kind of respect the democratic will of the community. So kind of the point being, it is a compromise that, you know, if there's that research out that they found, but people think that music is valuable, that's great. By all means, budget for that and put that in your programs, you know. So there's certainly a place for democratic will, community input, and, you know, what people find valuable in addition to, you know, what maybe um, more, you know, whatever you like to call it, research would say is the best way to close the achievement gap. Uh, let me give you a specific piece of research that does support exactly what you're saying. Robert Putnam, who's a very uh, well-known, renowned Harvard professor, came out with a book about six months ago called Our Kids. And in his analysis of uh, problems in education, he said the one most effective education practice that's being overlooked is extracurricular activities. For exactly the reason you said and Chuck said, because that teaches the interpersonal skills uh, the creativity of you know, being in a drama play, school newspapers, bands, all kinds of things. Kids have to work together, solve problems, and all the rest. Um, and uh, thank you for mentioning a, a good example of why our current uh, cost methodology and financing system is not fully responsive to the purposes of education as defined by the courts. During the uh, fiscal crisis, uh, when money was cut, the first thing most school districts cut was extracurricular and music and art. And there was no evidence-based um, funding for that. Uh, there's no legal basis for it, but that's the kind of thing that shouldn't happen. Thank you very much to our distinguished panel of researchers. Uh, we're going to take a brief break and then we'll come back and have the uh, putting this into practice. Thank you.